Is Cape Town's water crisis a cautionary tale for the rest of us? Joining me from Los Angeles to discuss the global implications is James Famlietti, a senior water scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. So is Cape Town a harbinger of things to come? I think Cape Town is really a, a wake-up call for other cities around the world. Again, climate change, changing uh, extremes of flooding and drought, population growth, uh, income inequality. These are, these are all factors that we have to include in our water resources management. And if we don't, then the, the threats, the potential for day zeros uh, around the world uh, is really heightened. Let's bring this a little closer to home. Uh, there's a drought situation in California, and you're very familiar with this. You've helped create this map uh, and what's happening here. And the, the increasing sort of red and dark brown areas are areas of drought. And you can see this progressing year after year after year after year. Um, what, what led to the intensity of this drought that California suffered? Well, what we're seeing in that video is really a combination of a lack of, a lack of rainfall, part of which may be the uh, climate change driven. But what's really driving uh, that animation is over-exploitation of groundwater. Um, and this is a problem that we've had in, in California for over a century. We use the water to, to fuel our agricultural sector, which is, which is quite productive. But we've been using it without any, any regulation, a significant regulation, until now. So only recently in 2014, did California pass the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act to try to slow the depletion of groundwater? Uh, but still, that will take a couple of decades to fully implement. And what about other cities in areas where perhaps, I mean, you think of California, it's got a coastline. And perhaps if it spends a ton of money, it can turn salt water into fresh water and take all the energy that it takes to do that. But there are lots of cities around the United States that don't have access to clean and fresh drinking water and perhaps not a, a, a water table like California does. That's right, and and I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, one of the one of the issues in Cape Town is the lack of development of of groundwater, and so the the future I think in many cities around the world is uh, a combination of surface and groundwater use managed jointly, um, some sewage recycling, some desalination if possible, uh, lots of conservation of course. Uh, maybe changes in water uh, water pricing. We like to say there's no there's no silver bullet. There's no one size fits all. Uh, so there will be region by region solutions. That said, I think cities are sustainable. I think the bigger challenge for the global population is growing food in these conditions that we're seeing globally. And satellites have revealed, as you've shown in the animations, the disappearance of groundwater. So I think on the one hand we have sustainable cities in terms of water supply for drinking and economic growth uh, and energy production, but not necessarily for food production. So this is, a, this is a big issue that I don't think that desalination and sewage recycling uh, are going to resolve. You know, we just saw some of the consequences or some of the challenges that people are facing in Cape Town right now. But we also have a, a map of what's happened in the Middle East over the past 15 to 20 years. And you can see, and, and people might not see the borders on this page, we're talking about parts of Iran and very importantly, parts of Syria. And as Syria kind of increases in that drought area, then you probably saw a huge surge of people rushing into the cities and creating some of the political instability that preceded the civil war. That is the, the narrative that, that has emerged. And, and I think, you know, there are many hotspots uh, like the Middle East and uh, like we see in California uh, around the world, in, in India, on the India-Pakistan border, into Bangladesh, the North China Plain, the Hwarni Aquifer down in South America. These are all regions where um, violent conflict uh, is, is a real possibility and in some places already happening, uh, uh, for example, in the Middle East. California was on the brink of their own day zero until you basically had one good rainy season. But what we're also seem to be seeing is that the intensity of the rainstorms are increasing. So it's not just kind of that California is evenly getting sprinkles. We've just been doing stories in the past few weeks about intense rains that have caused mudslides after the forest fires. It's kind of all connected. That's, that's right. And so one of the biggest implications of climate change 
uh, is the change in what we call the hydrologic extremes or more extreme flooding, more extreme drought. And in many places around the world, and, and California is one of those, and the Central Valley in California and Cape Town is one of those as well, we can expect uh, more prolonged drought, longer droughts punctuated by shorter periods of more intense rainfall. Uh, so we have, we have huge challenges ahead of us. And if we wanna avert future day zeros, in other cities around the world, now is the time to begin planning for the future and managing to those extremes. Help us explain how these cycles are connected. How does increased drought lead to forest fires that lead to mudslides and rain? And we kind of connect the dots for us. Sure, uh, if we have prolonged drought, um, the fuel for the fire comes from forest die off. So there's plenty of fuel there um, once that vegetation is burned off, um, then the hill slopes, which are very steep, become very, susceptible, become very susceptible to erosion. And then when the rainy season occurs, if the slope is steep enough and there's not enough vegetation to sort of capture the rain and help it diffuse through, the, through a hill slope, then that uh, hill slope can fail and, and we have a landslide. All right, Jay Familiotti, a senior water scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, joining us from Los Angeles. Thanks so much. Thank you.